Greetings. I've got another production for you today. I realized there was someone else who, when they occurred to me, my mind would sort of fixate on for a while, and so I started digging into their story, and I kept going deeper and deeper and found it more and more interesting until I finally wound up with, similarly, not just a good story that I felt was worth sharing, but also a college sophomore dorm level discussion of said story. That person is Mbai Dien. He was a Senegalese peacekeeper with the UN uh, during the Rwandan genocide in 1994. And he is personally credited with saving anywhere from a couple hundred to over a thousand lives single-handedly. Um, his story is not particularly well known, but you can find bits and pieces of it if you dig. And he's always regarded as a hero, and that's not really up for debate. I'm not going to tell you that he's not in this. Uh, what I'm going to tell you is that he's an unusual kind of hero that I found illuminating, because he not only sort of combines a lot of the different types of heroism into one huge pattern of awesomeness, but he also uses other characteristics, qualities, and virtues that allow him to be so courageous and so successful. And so I'm going to dive into those and his many feats uh, in our talk today. Part of what I had to do in order to really learn about this guy was I had to educate myself somewhat on the Rwandan genocide and civil war and all those hideous activities. And I went down a rabbit hole there and I have some backstory for you that I'm going to try to pare down to the bare minimum, uh, just enough to let you know what he was doing there, what was going on, where this conflict came from. Then I'm going to walk you through some of Captain Mbai's greatest hits, because he has like a couple of like well-known feats of courage that saved the day a few times. Then I'm going to talk about what he did day-to-day -day when he did most of his life-saving work, and then I'm going to start uh, diving into the ins and outs of what I noticed about his heroism and why I think he's worth thinking about beyond just marble bust in a pantheon kind of hero. So the Rwandan genocide happened when I was a kid and all I can remember from the news was the Hutus and the Tutsi. And I just assumed that they were tribes, and it was an ethnic conflict, and never thought about it any more than that. And it goes a little bit deeper than that, so I'll give you a little bit of backstory here. Rwanda, from the mists of time, is this agricultural kingdom in equatorial Africa. It's at a higher elevation, so it's a little bit less hot. It has, they grow bananas there, coffee is their main cash export in later times. And it's got a hilly terrain and a sort of like pretty dense network of villages across its landscape. You don't go very far before you run into another village. Uh, and the capital city, Kigali, which is where Captain Abai is going to work, is a pretty small city. At the time of the genocide, it's got about a population of a quarter million. And it's pretty hilly, too. It looks sort of Pittsburghy, hilly, hill wise to me in the uh, images that I saw. So, the Hutus and the Tutsis, who are they? From way back when, they were the two groups in Rwanda. But nobody really knows if there even is an ethnic difference between them. In ancient Rwanda, Hutu meant commoner and Tutsi meant nobleman. And that was all it really meant. If you were a Hutu, you were a farmer. And if you were a Tutsi, you raised cattle. And there was mobility between the groups. So if you were a successful Hutu farmer, and then you bought some cattle and made that your source of income, you would be promoted, I guess you could say, to Tutsi. And vice versa, if you're Tutsi and you sold your cattle, you'd become, you'd become Hutu then. These groups were sort of static over the years. Because of Romana's terrain, there's not a whole lot of migration into it. and It's pretty dense. They, didn't, they couldn't carry a lot more population than what they had. So that was a pretty static, but fluid and not inflexible system. So the Europeans colonized it in the late 1800s, and things changed a little bit. 
because at this time, the Europeans are obsessed with pseudoscientific race and ethnic theory. So they wanted to sort of categorize all the differences between groups of people on ethnic racial lines. So they looked at these two groups and they said, well, clearly they're different ethnicities. And they ruled through the Tutsis. You know, figure your colonial power, you want to rule as cheap as possible, so you rule through the structure that's there. So they said, well, the Tutsis are better than the Hutu, and so we're going to document that, and we're going to put a rule in place, which is that if your father is a Tutsi, you're a Tutsi, and if your father's a Hutu, you're a Hutu. We're also going to give you identity cards that say whether you're a Tutsi or a Hutu. This will become problematic later. So after the Second World War, Belgium, the country that's in charge of Rwanda as a colony, realizes that they have to liberate it. They have to set it up as a free country. So they realize that it's going to have to be a democracy, and they realize that they're going to have to reverse everything that they've been doing, because the Tutsis at the top of the pyramid are a distinct minority. And they realize that once there's going to be a democracy in Rwanda, that the Hutu are going to rule. So all of the rules that they had in place that favored Tutsis in education and in jobs and in opportunities, they had to flip on their heads. This didn't go very well. And so in 1959, when they tried to do independence for the first time, it was sort of a false start and it collapsed. There were some massacres of Tutsi and about 300,000 Tutsi refugees fled to Burundi. It's a little country next door. In 1962, independence was tried again, and it was more successful. Rwanda emerged as a functioning Hutu state. Those Tutsi refugees will become important later. They will coalesce into a group called the RPF, and they'll sort of wander around for a while and get some training in the Ugandan bush wars. And they will be standing ready at the border in 1990. So we've said there are some massacres and some driving out of groups of the Tutsis here, and that is unfortunately the case. There is ethnic tension now. There's massacres and counter-massacres between Tutsis and Hutus. These two groups are also present in Burundi, but Burundi is run by a Tutsi government. And so in 1972, for example, there's a huge massacre of the Hutus in Burundi, and about 200,000 might have been killed. Uh, the numbers are a little bit difficult to dig up on that, but it's certainly a situation where there have been historical large massacres, and there is a lot of tension between the Hutus and the Tutsis now. But in 1973, we actually get a little bit of relief from that, because a guy named Juvenal Habyarimana becomes president of Rwanda via coup. He is a Hutu, but he is an ethnic moderate. What he's really interested in doing is keeping power. He establishes a one-party state and, in fact, bans all political activity. So the upshot of that is that the ethnic difficulties sort of simmer down. There's no outlet for them, and there's no massacre or counter-massacre that occurs here for a while. So for over 10 years, things are relatively calm. Until 1989, when coffee prices crash. Something happens with the world economy, coffee prices crash. So because that's Rwanda's cash crop, their economy goes in the toilet at once. At this point, those Tutsi refugees are watching from across the border in Uganda, and they think that it's an opportune time to strike. They invade and begin the Civil War of 1990. Now, these rebels are a shoestring operation. Their budget is next to zero, but they have excellent discipline, unlike the government troops, and they have excellent leadership, unlike the government troops. These guys on the rebel side, on the Tutsi rebel side, have been training for years, and a lot of them have combat experience. So they can take the battle to the government forces and acquit themselves quite well. They're led by a guy named Paul Kagame, who everybody that beats and all the things that I read talk about how impressed they are with his intelligence. And, spoiler alert, if you look up who the president of Rwanda is today, he wins. Uh, he's, he's leading them, and... He's definitely got the upper hand in the battlefield. From 92 to 93, he agrees to a ceasefire with Javier Imana's government. Uh, Kagame is worried about looking like an extremist to the world. He doesn't want the old colonial powers to come in under the guise of peacekeeping and interfere with his civil war. 
Papiari Mana just needs some breathing room because he's got a lot of troubles as it is. The Civil War has really made him uncomfortable in his position at home. He had to make some political concessions, like allowing other parties to be established in 1991. There have also been some hardliners gaining power at the like far wing of his government. They go across parties. They're called the Hutu Power, or the Akizu clan, and they are exterminationist. Uh, I don't know how to put... I can't properly phrase how extreme they are. So, he's got them on one side, he's got the members of other parties on the other side, he's got the Tutsi rebel forces on the third side, so Javier Mana is definitely willing to negotiate. And so in 1993, there is a peace agreement hammered out, the Arusha Accords. What happens there is, there's a demilitarized zone set up, which if you don't know what that is, is it's a buffer zone between the opposing forces where you're not allowed to send soldiers. It makes accidental gunfire incidents much less likely, and it reduces the ability of one side to sort of launch a sneak attack on the other. Another thing that it does is it sends a small unit of Tutsi rebel troops to a fortress in Kigali, and it also sends up a mandate for a new government to be established in Rwanda with multiple parties, but which leaves out the hardliner Hutu power party. Needless to say, the members of these parties are not happy with the Urusha Accords. They retreat and decide that they're going to undermine everything they can. They go to the countryside and they start setting up militias and a propaganda radio network. They do have quite a bit of power in the Rwandan government. The propaganda radio network is RTLM, which mixes today's top hits with psychotic exterminationist propaganda. There are some clips on YouTube. Listen if you're curious. And they also set up these militias, which they start arming and training, and one of the most notorious of them is named the Interahamwe, which ominously translates to those who attack together, and they indoctrinate them at the same time, so they've got a lot of willing subjects out in the provinces, if you will. The Arusha Accords also sends the UN to Rwanda, which is how Captain Mbai winds up there. The goal of the UN mission was to police the peace. They were to monitor the DMZ, and they were to monitor the situation in Kigali. They were not meant to be there for humanitarian or genocide prevention. They were meant to be sort of an equal, open arbiter and a hotline between the two opposing sides. So what Captain Mbai's job is, is he's a liaison with the Rwandan government headquarters. He's going to run back and forth with messages about whatever they have to talk to with the UN, whether it's, I mean, any kind of logistical thing they have to set up with umpteen messages back and forth. The UN is not supposed to be there for humanitarian or genocide prevention or anything like that. They have a very restrictive mandate, they're horribly undersupplied, and they don't have a lot of combat troops. This happened, if you'll remember, right after the Somalian and experience. So the major nations of the world were really unwilling to send a lot of troops. Part of the reason Captain Abai is there is because he's Senegalese and the official languages of Senegal and Rwanda are French. So while this small UN force is there taking stock of things, setting up, making sure that the peace is intact, they can feel tensions rising. The Hutu power guys are increasing their pace of operations, they're making lists of Tutsi residents in various areas, and one of the other things that they notice is that the government troops that are around Kigali or around the DMZ seem to be trying to incite incidents with the UN troops. So the commander of the UN forces, a general, Romeo Dallaire, is super suspicious. He's a clever dude. He wrote a really good book about it too, by the way. So he and his officers notice that tensions are a little bit... And people that were later interviewed that were citizens in Rwanda noted the people that were active in these militias quit talking to Tutsi around this time, even old friends that they'd had. Some guy 
this one group of interviews that I read was like the head of the local militia and it seemed like it started out as a social club, but by this time he was very much more militant. So January 94, with all this going on, Dallaire gets an informant from inside the Hutu government saying that there is a warehouse full of weapons and a plan from government hardliners to arm militias and kill all the Tutsis that they can, basically. So Dallaire checks it out, and the intel checks out, so he decides to raid it. He sends a telegram to UN headquarters in New York saying, I'm going to raid this arms cache. He does not ask permission. So he goes to sleep, planning to go there in the morning, and instead he wakes up to a telegram from the UN slapping his wrists for even thinking of doing something so out of line, and how dare he, and he'd better bring this information to the Hutu government. And so he's just got his head in his hands at this point, and he can kind of see the writing on the wall. Rwanda is at this point in time really a powder keg. And on April 6th, it's set off. President Javier Imana's plane is shot down near Kigali Airport and he's killed. This results in a few things happening in rapid succession. The hardliners inside the Hutu government, led by a guy named Theonest Bagaslora, immediately launch a coup. They seize moderate Hutu leaders and kill them, including the actual like, legal next in line, Agate Ulingyamana, the prime minister. They don't just kill her, but they also kidnap her UN escorts and execute them quite publicly. This is all part of their plan to scare off the United Nations from interfering with them. Meanwhile, on the countryside, the administrators are ordered to war against the Tutsis, and the death of President Javier Imana really resonates with the people. For some reason, in interviews that I read of normal Hutus that hadn't been in militias until this point, all of a sudden now they felt really threatened and they were willing to listen to this lunacy coming from the administrators. The Rwandan genocide begins in earnest at this point. It's crowdsourced, for lack of a better term. The administrators collect local adult males throughout the countryside in their villages. They turn them loose, sometimes with military or police or militia leaders. They don't even need lists in a lot of places because Rwanda is a little bit of a provincial, everybody knows everybody place. So in all of these villages, everybody knows who the Tutsis are. And in the cities, thanks to these ID cards, they can find out really quickly. The estimates are that there are maybe a quarter million people that actually take part in the killing. So with all of this exploding, the Tutsi rebel forces, the RPF, are sitting across the demilitarized zone saying, well, I think that it's probably time to get to it here, and they attack. They attack the government forces across the demilitarized zone, so the civil war is now back on also. So now in Kigali we have the civil war going on between the rebel forces and their little fortress and the government forces, the coup unfolding, and a massive genocide breaking out on the streets. And it is in this scene that we are introduced to Captain Mbai. So let's talk about Captain Mbaidien. Who is he, what's his backstory, and what's he doing here? He is Senegalese, he's from a village outside Dakar, the capital city. He is an educated man, he has a degree in economics from the University of Dakar, and he's an army vet. He, I don't know when he joined the army, but he's a veteran, he's been in combat in like a sort of low-level insurgency along the Senegalese border before. What does he look like? I'm going to have some pictures up of him, so you know, at least see what his face looks like. He's super tall and lanky, like very, very spindly almost, and uh, very energetic. General Dallaire said that the way he moved and everything he did, it was like his internal metronome was set fast. And that kind of looks like the case in all the videos that I've seen of him. Uh, he chain smokes. I have only found a few pictures of him in which he is not smoking. And... Uh, so for all of the talk that I'm going to do about how good of a way he had with people, he could make a bad first impression on people. Some people said that they met him and he was so sort of 
forward and sarcastic that they were put off by him. But because he was so warm and kind, and that really showed eventually, he would make a really good third or fourth impression, and they would wind up loving the guy. His job is to be the liaison with the government army, like I referred to before. And because the civil war has started and the genocides has started and everything has gone to hell, doesn't mean that that job is over. He's still going to need to run messages back and forth between the UN headquarters and the government offices, ideally to get a new ceasefire negotiated. But even while the war and everything is raging, logistics... If the UN guys have to have some supplies flown into the airport, they need to tell the government guys to not shoot at military planes that come to the airport, that sort of thing. What I suspect is also happening between how smart Dallaire is and how witty Deanne is, is I suspect that Dallaire is using his veterans, like him by Deanne, that are running around doing all these jobs as a substitute for intelligence. The UN mission also forbade an actual intelligence capability to the UN mission. So Dallaire is probably relying on these guys to be his eyes and ears. And I should mention, he is an unarmed military observer. He has nothing beyond a Toyota truck. Which is a little alarming because of what he's going to see in Kigali. So I've decided... I've, discussed the geography of it a little bit, and I'll describe what happens with this genocide a little bit, is there's basically two things going on. The militias form roving bands that are running around looking for hiding Tutsis to kill, and then there are other militiamen that have set up roadblocks constantly all over the city where they check your ID, and if you are a Tutsi, or if you don't have an ID, they will just take you to the side of the road and kill you. So there's piles of bodies stacked up next to these. And they occur quite regularly. I was reading an account of a survivor, and he was trying to sneak across the city to get to Hotel Rwanda, and it was like a two- or a three-mile trip, and he must have gone through ten or a dozen checkpoints to get there. So these checkpoints are very dense across the landscape. It's really hard to get anywhere. And every quarter mile at best, you're facing one of these roadblocks with uh, a half a dozen or so guys who are at least somewhat armed. They have machetes in a lot of cases. Some of them have guns. And uh, a lot of them have been drinking a lot during the day because this is what they're doing instead of their normal jobs the militia or the government people that are leading them are supplying them with as much alcohol as they think they need to get the job done, so to speak. So, the first time we see Captain Tien in action is right at the beginning with the Prime Minister's kids. I mentioned earlier that Prime Minister Wulingiamana is murdered by the coup executors, and her kids go into hiding, they escape the compound where she lives, and they get into a neighboring UN compound. There's a bunch of UN employees there, basically not native Rwandans. While they escape, the hardliners are raging all through the city, and you can imagine everything's on fire, and all this disaster that I've described is just getting underway. The UN employees call General Dallaire, or get a hold of him on the radio, and let him know that these kids are hiding there. And so, Dallaire runs over there. He gets to the compound where they're hiding, and he walks inside. And this is sort of like a open courtyard with buildings around it sort of compound. He walks inside, and who does he see but Captain Dien? Uh, Captain Dien is wandering around, was well, not really wandering, but he's walking around in there, taking stock of the situation. And Dallaire notes that the people that are inside are, like, following him around as though he's their source of strength and gravity in this completely chaotic moment. Captain Dien sees General Dallaire, goes up to him, briefs him on the situation, and they figure out a plan between the two of them. Dallaire has these, like, totally ratchety armored vehicles that he wants to bring up. In his, I read Dallaire's account of the whole situation, and very good, but proceed with caution. But one of the more amusing things that goes on is he has, like, eight Vietnam-era armored personnel carriers, and the guys that are crewing them 
can only ever keep about four or five of them running at any given time because they don't have any spare parts, so they have to just cannibalize the ones that are running. So for whatever reason, Dallaire can't get these armored cars to show up. And he's gone by this time. All hell is breaking loose, and his presence has been required elsewhere. He has left Captain Dien to make sure that this mission is carried through. Well, once they realize that the armored cars aren't going to come, Captain Dien has to improvise. So he realizes he has some blankets in the back of his car, and he says, I'm going to take the children with me. So he takes the Prime Minister's kids, hides them under the blankets, and, in General Dallaire's words, drives like hell across the city until he gets to what we know as the Hotel Rwanda. It's Hotel de Mille Colline. This is where Captain Dien and some of his comrades were stationed. It was a UN outpost, and it isn't yet, but li very quickly becomes the sort of humanitarian safe zone that we know it as. So he gets the kids to safety there, but he's not quite done working for the night, because somehow the militiamen get word that the Prime Minister's kids are in the hotel. And later that night, a couple of these militia guys show up, and they announce loudly to anyone who listened their intention to kick every door in the hotel in until they find the Prime Minister's kids and kill them. So Captain Dien confronts them. Again, I emphasize, unarmed. He does not carry a gun at any point during these proceedings. And Captain Dien talks them out of... But no one knows what he said, but he talked to them for a while, and they just sort of shrugged and went home. It's quite a performance. But it's only the first of many. There's another pretty famous story of his daring and also his ability to talk people out of killing other people at a nearby church. There's a church that's sort of like, because of the geography of Kigali, in his daily travels, Captain Tien would have driven past it or walked past it very regularly. Kigali is very hilly, and so there's sort of like an arcing, looping road and Hotel de Rwanda's uh, inside of it, and this church, Saint Famille, is on the outside of it. Now, these churches were sort of refuges during the genocide, but in some hideous cases, when the killers knew that some Tutsis were hiding in them, they would seal off the entrance and exits, and they would kill all the people inside. So the UN guys would make it a habit to check in on them, or if they heard that bad hat things might be coming, some of them would sleep on folding chairs outside of them. Uh, Captain Dien is not the only unknown hero of this whole disaster. Uh, so this lady, Miss Mukumwezi, is walking down the street by Saint Famille, and a priest comes around the corner, followed by a couple of militiamen. This priest's attire is strangely accessorized with an AK, a pistol, and some grenades. And he notices that she is a Tutsi, and he announces to his comrades that he is going to shoot her. So he's standing there, and he takes aim on her with his AK. At just this minute, Captain Dien comes around the corner. He sees what's happening, and immediately sprints in between them and starts shouting at the guy. He says, why do you want to kill this woman? You mustn't kill her. What's she done? He's just berating this priest. And it's a similar situation to the one I just described with the militiamen, where... The priest just sort of shrugs and they go away. I don't know if at this point they were sketched out about killing a UN peacekeeper right there on the streets because some of the government guys certainly were not. Or if this is just part of his wonderful way with people, but he just stops them from killing her. And like so many stories in Rwanda, there's no like closing action here. When the lady's telling the story in the documentary that I watched, she just says, I didn't get killed that day, and that's sort of like the best outcome of any story in Rwanda during this time. There's another story involving a British journalist. This guy named Mark Doyle worked for the BBC, and he actually produced one of the larger documentaries that mentions Captain Mbaye. probably the only one that's really about him that's out there. And he was assigned to the UN headquarters with some special access. General Dallaire was desperate to get the outside world to care about what was going on. And so he told Doyle, you can do whatever you want, you can say whatever you want, just file one story a day and make sure it's true. So one day, he was out gathering a story by writing with Captain Dien. And they approached one of these checkpoints, and the guys manning the checkpoint 
you notice the white guy in the car clearly, and they are immediately hostile, and they ask if he's a Belgian. And Captain Mumbai knows this is a problem because there's bad blood with the former Belgian colonials. And he thinks that probably this is going to wind up with some disaster if he can't deal with it. And so what he does is he makes a joke and he says, yeah, there's a Belgian in the car. It's me. I'm a black Belgian. See? And he puts his very dark arm up into the guy's face. And this joke doesn't really translate. I don't know why it's funny, but the militiamen, like, crack up at it. And so he pauses for a second, lets them laugh, and then he sort of changes into military mode and he orders them aside and they just get out of the way and they manage to drive through. Weird. A weird story. Another larger scale event where he saves the day involves a large refugee convoy. One of the things that the UN negotiated between the government and the Tutsi rebels was an exchange of civilians. Sort of like a giant hostage exchange. So they took 600 Tutsi from inside Kigali and they shipped them out across the lines to the RPF Tutsi-controlled sector, while the RPF shipped 600 Hutus into Kigali. That was the goal, anyway. They get the convoy together, and Captain Bai and a couple other UN guys get on. And on their way out of Kigali, they're stopped by some group of militiamen. And they have apparently not gotten the memo that this convoy is supposed to go through. And they advance aggressively on the convoy, and the leader announces their plans to kill them. In fact, his guys advance so aggressively that some of the UN guys confront them and are, in some ladies' account, like kicking them in the face, trying to get them to not climb up onto the trucks and start killing people. So Captain Mumbai runs up to the leader of the militia, and he says, no, just no, you cannot do this. You have to kill me first if you're going to kill these people. And so this gives the guy pause, because again, this is probably not a militia that's super close to the government, because maybe they would have gotten the memo that way. But at any rate, they're, he talks them down. Again, they don't kill this large group of innocent people. And I don't know if they were able to get that convoy out or if they had to turn around, but he does save them from being massacred by this group of militia guys. So those are some of Captain Avai's greatest hits, if you will. But that is actually not where he did most of his life-saving endeavors. Most of what he did was day-to-day -day during his normal activities and during his off hours. Because during for, for his job, he would be driving all over the city all day. And what he would do is, on these trips, he would pick up Tutsis from hiding and take them to safety, simply. I had to do a little bit of inference on this one. I had to sort of read between the lines from some sources, and then I had some later corroboration once I found some more information. So what it looks like happens is, he had a lot of sources for intel from the people staying in Hotel Rwanda. They were you know, a bunch of Tutsis hiding from the Hutu killers. And so they were telling him, well, yeah, because of Bob is staying in a basement three blocks over from where I live, or my friend is hiding out in this ravine behind this or that block. He also had access to some bribe materials there. There were some professionals staying there with some money. There were some stockpiles of booze in the basement of the hotel. And so he collected that, so he drove around with money, cartons of cigarettes, cases of beer and booze, and information on where people were hiding. And so in the course of his duties, he would take a detour, you know, smooth-talking and or bribing his way through the checkpoints as he went, getting to where he expected these people to be, picking them up, and either continuing his mission, or if his mission was already done, taking them back to Hotel Rwanda, or another safe spot. There were a couple of UN safe areas that were under constant guard around Kigali, like the soccer stadium, for example. He can only drive around a few at a time. You know, he has to keep them hidden as much as he can in the car. And nobody really knows the whole story. He's, he did so much of this in the shadows that... Like, one of the things that I was desperate to find and couldn't was an account of someone that he saved. 
I wanted to hear somebody talk about like where they were hiding and how he got the information to come get them and then what the procedure was that he followed to extract them. And I was not able to find that. So I don't know if he went to places where he thought he was safe and pulled up outside and honked the horn or if he had people sneak them out in back alleys or whatever. But that's what he did. Unfortunately, Captain and Vi's story isn't complete without one final incident, which is that on May 30th, he was sitting in his Jeep at one of these many roadblocks, and a mortar round landed behind the Jeep, and it shrapnelized, it went into the Jeep, and it hit him in the back of the head and killed him instantly. And let me tell you, it is rough to listen to what the other people in the mission had to say about losing him. It was a very serious blow to all of them, and I think it was a mixture of the whole situation by then was clearly so terrible. I mean, it was 55 days into the genocide, roughly. The whole genocide was completed in 100 days. 800,000 people were killed in 100 days in Rwanda. And so they were well aware of, they were all completely submerged in the awfulness. They also were starting to get an idea of what he'd been up to. And also it seemed like he was their star in a lot of ways. Somebody referred to him as a real life cool hand Luke. And I think everybody looked to him as a bright star that would help them get through and be laughing at the end of it all. And that was unfortunately not the case. So. I'd like to talk a little bit about how much I admire this guy, and you might wonder why. It seems kind of self-evident. Yeah, this guy went out and risked his neck and saved a bunch of people and then he died. End of story. But from learning a little bit about what was going on there and thinking about him, I think that his acts span a greater range of heroic qualities. And I think they kind of teach us a little bit about what goes into and what can help you be brave. Uh, first of all, I was looking around for a discussion of courage when this idea was even less well-formed in my mind. And there's not a lot of resources out there that discuss it in any detail or depth. I had to wind up going to psychology magazines to pull something serviceable out. And I don't know what that says about modern society, but... Anyway. There are a lot of different types of courage, and I think that the many circumstances that Captain Bai had to handle while he was saving these people really hits a lot of these high points. So I'm gonna walk you through some of what I noticed. His physical courage is clear, it's obvious. That's why you're wondering why I'm going into this. But I'd like to tell you, he embroiders that kind of legendary physical courage a little bit. If you think about a lot of our... I'm a regular middle-class American, and so my image of heroes is strangely formed by Braveheart. Braveheart's a really good example of what Captain Mbai is not because Captain Mbai was not a loose cannon at all. He had everything to go home and live for, and he did not he did not have anything remotely resembling a death wish. He had a wife, he had kids, he had an education and a resume, and to that kid's point, unfortunately, his son only remembers him when, from when he was a very young child. His son was about six or seven when all this went down. His daughter doesn't really remember him at all, and he would have had to have known that. He was very conscious of death. There are some really tough interviews with his wife that Mark Doyle did where she talks about some of the conversations she had with him on the phone. And he was very conscious of the threat of death all the time. And he had no interest in <laughs> dying whatsoever. Uh, he was every bit as afraid of dying as you, would, you or I would be, I think. He also adds on that cool hand Lukeism. He's 
able to talk loosely and be normal when he's scared for his life, which is a special sort of badass. At all of these checkpoints, he's got to know that any false step, or even no false step, if the guys are drunk enough and are manning it, can result in him getting killed. But he's still able to smile and laugh and give them cigarettes and bribe his way through or whatever, which is a pretty awesome instance of self-control. So, there are other types of courage that I think we forget to begin with, and then we nod, we're like, oh yeah, when we hear about them. But I think they're a really big part of what Captain Nimbai did. Like, moral courage, in the whatever definition that I was able to find, was doing what's right in the face of opposition or shame. There was a lot of opposition to what Captain Nimbai was doing, not just the practical day-to-day, but he was operating outside the UN rules. He didn't have any protection for what he was doing. He could have been court-martialed and cashiered for it. Uh, There's nothing. Nobody was sanctioning it. Dolaire turned a blind eye, and his other superiors allowed it to go on. I don't think that was a really major threat to him, but he had no official sanction. It was also, everything was a huge pain in the ass. It was very difficult to get any of these things done. It must have been infuriating and incredibly frustrating to have to work your way halfway across the city in an, over a course of hours to try to find somebody. He was also alone and had no one that he could commiserate with. And that goes to another point, but first I'd like to mention even... He couldn't talk about anything because of operational security, if nothing else. General Dallaire noticed that there were a whole lot of leaks that were coming from he never really figured out where. So Captain Mbai did what he did without any discussion of it with other people in even the UN organization, except for those that he worked with to move people out. This must have been a really lonely thing to do, you know? He's operating without anybody that he can talk to about it, without anybody that's helping him, without anybody that has his back institutionally either. Uh, he's got no support, either immediately or profoundly. The UN is, at best, clueless in everything that I've read, and the world caught fire, his world, caught fire pretty quick here and went to hell. He's barely got any supplies, Dallaire talks about the conditions on the UN mission, and he mentions at one point they were out of toilet paper and clean water for a matter of a couple weeks. Uh, no thanks on that one. And yet he still went out. He still showed initiative every day to get up and do it. Also, it's quite possible that he impoverished himself. I don't know how much of the bribe material came out of his pocket, but it's very possible that he did contribute himself. There's a thing that's separate from moral courage, I guess, called emotional courage, which is sort of like risking your sanity and well-being. It's exposing yourself to the most horrible possibilities. I guess in the high school sense, it would be like asking that person out that you are desperate to date and terrified of rejection by. But in Captain Bias' case, it's a little bit more profound because he dives in daily while tens of thousands of people are dying. Everywhere he goes in Kigali, there are stacks of bodies and you hear screaming and gunshots 24-7. I had a section of my notes while I was doing background research on this that I just labeled horror porn and I just tried to shove everything in there. And if any of you out there are interested in learning about Rwanda, I would say it's fascinating, but proceed with caution. General Dallaire went home and had at least one suicide attempt and was arrested for drunken disorderly in a park and had to go to rehab. The lady that helped him on his book died by suicide. This was very, very scarring to experience. And what that also is, is Everybody is a little bit of a reminder of inadequacy and failure. The mission failed, the ceasefire failed, and what the hell was he going to do in the face of all this? He also has fear of failure, because 
I would anticipate that he had to have lost people that he expected to pick up. Or he was also not the sole custodian of these people. He was taking them and moving them on and exfiltrating, for lack of a better word. But he was he was shipping them. They were, other, they were handled by other people after he got them out of the immediate danger. And at a lot of places along that chain, they could have been killed. There's a lot that could go wrong. And that's, I mean, that's a really good excuse for it. And really easy to stay home when that's the sort of thing that could happen. It just compounds that feeling of futility. And if they die on your watch, you failed. And if they die when they're not on your watch, sort of the universe has failed. It's very... I think that the situation in Rwanda had about limitless possibility to destroy your well-being. So let me talk about what I think are the characteristics that helped Captain and Bai perform these feats of heroism. Because the more I thought about it, the closer I got to this, which is that these are things that I never associated with heroism before I considered Captain and Bai's story. And now I realize how important they were to being able to be such the hero that he was. Number one, tenacity. What he did had to have been exa completely exhausting. He had a job to do. And what he did to save people made every single day that he had to perform much harder. It added over time. On it. it got rid of his days off. And when he went home he was still in a an inadequately guarded UN safe spot. But on his own initiative, he would go out, get them, and bring them back. At least. One of the UN guys had an interesting point, which was, he said, as they would see these groups of people appearing and disappearing, what the hell operation was he running? Captain and I might have been doing, in fact, more to save people even than what we know about. He could have been operating a little bit of a sort of black market operation in shipping people out of Hutu-controlled territory in Rwanda, which is an even more gigantic ordeal and operation than what we know he was doing. I mean, the energy to do that is unthinkable to me. And to make it more exhausting is the acute threat to life over and over and over again that he had to choose to confront over and over again. I did a quick back of the envelope calculation. If you think that he saved maybe 600 people, which would be right about in the middle, and he saved three people for trip, which would be a little higher than normal, that's 200 trips. Say he only had to go an extra mile out of his way per trip. Well, that's two or three extra checkpoints that he had to go through in order to save these people. So what he was looking at was 400 to 600 extra total checkpoints in order to save 600 people. Over the 55 or so days that he was active in Rwanda, that meant 10 additional threats to his life per day to save these people. And... I can't imagine the adrenal kick that you get driving you as you wait in line to go through one of these hideous checkpoints and probably seeing people getting killed in front of you at least now and then. There's a classical virtue. It seems like in the old days they had a better handle on discussing courage. There's a classical virtue called fortitude, which is a mixture of courage and patience and perseverance. And it's that perseverance that really strikes me about Captain and I, which is he made this decision day after day, time after time, to go and get these people and bring them to safety. There's an Emerson quote that I enjoyed while I was looking this up, which is, a hero is no braver than an ordinary man, but he is brave five minutes longer. He had to do a lot of waiting in addition to his many chosen trips, like waiting for people to appear. Like I said earlier, I don't know what the mechanics were for his rescues. I'm sure they varied. But he must have had to exercise quite a bit of patience waiting for the people, waiting to find the people, looking for the people that he was trying to bring to safety. 
I can't imagine what kind of stresses he had to endure while he was finding them, you know. And while he's waiting for them, there are also roving militiamen around that could also just as immediately be a threat to his life. So with all this, I think I've been hinting at how easy it would have been for him to despair. With everything being on fire, the coup, the civil war going on around him, and the genocide, and the mission being mostly abandoned by the UN, it would have been so easy to give in to the feelings of just futility and just serve out his time and go. When he was killed, he was only like 10 days or so from going home. And I think that would, I can understand that that would be incredibly tempting to people. It would also be difficult to not despair when you saw some of the other things that were going on which was, mercifully, I didn't find a lot of this, but I did find a couple accounts of people sort of soaking the refugees or conning them. They would say, hey, give me your money and I'm going to get you to safety, or give me a bribe and I won't kill you or whatever, and then going back on their word and in some cases turning them over to killers, or in other cases it was the killers doing it and they would just shoot them after they stole I don't think, in light of all of these things, anybody would have ever called him out for giving up, especially after all the work that he'd done. There was nobody that was really, there was nobody with power that was interested in stopping this genocide. A lot of the other UN guys did feats of courage that were super impressive, but nobody from, really, the UN... Nobody from the Western world, nobody from anywhere else, was interested in stepping in to stop this. Even people that you would think would have an interest in doing it, like the Tutsi rebel forces, the RPF, did not do anything to stop the genocide, per se. They were interested in winning the civil war first, second, and last. In fact, Dallaire talks about how he admired Kagame as a commander, but at the same time hated the guy as a humanitarian because he went on a maneuver war to kick the government's forces rear ends out in the countryside and circled around Kigali rather than attacking into the city to stop, hopefully, the uh, violence sooner. And with all of the exhaustion and the filth and the insanity around, I think that nobody would have ever called Captain Bai out for giving it up. It would have been exhausting. And I have a quote from Patton to balance out the Emerson quote earlier, which is, Fatigue makes cowards of us all. So I realized there was another factor, another quality that Captain Abai brought to the table that helped him in his daring do that I had never considered as an appropriate or helpful component of heroism before, which is discipline. This is ghastly to me because I have none of this. Uh, but it's Captain Abai's discipline. During the ceasefire, until the Civil War and genocide started, that pushed him to the attention to detail that helped him get to work. He got to know the people and the terrain of Kigali intimately. He knew all of the guys manning the barricades, either from before the conflict or during the course of it. He got to know them. And I wonder if it's also the discipline that's the source of the confidence that he has. In all these cases where he talks the killers out of massacring people, including himself. This confidence that he has when he inserts himself into the scene, I wonder if the commanding presence of his body and voice is a product of the discipline that he has. I don't know. What I do know is that he was mission-oriented. Uh, there's a wonderful story that perfectly encapsulates that, which is the BBC journalist Doyle wrote a story about the killers one day and filed it, and it was, as you would expect, it was a discussion of these monsters that are massacring people everywhere. And Captain Mbai learned about it, and he confronted Doyle. He took him aside, and he said, What are you doing? I'm trying to work here. Could you not enrage these guys, please? And what that story told me was that Captain Mbai, who had more reason than just about anybody on Earth to hate these guys, these barricades, 
did not let his mind stray over there because that would endanger his mission. What he had to do to save people was to be friendly to these guys, and he managed to force himself to do it, no matter what the circumstance. And it's his attention to detail that I think really helped him out in this cause and others, which is not only does he know the terrain, not only does he know the city, but he does know these killers. And he, through the course of his travels, manages to somehow learn their life stories and get to know them while he's under threat of his life and while he's executing these missions and just also his full-time job, which he is also doing, by the way, at this time. I wonder how much of this notorious energy that he had was strictly a matter of will. I don't think anybody can sprint through hell 24-7, and that's basically what he was doing. Captain Bai was also resourceful. He has this one talent that he can use, and man, he leverages it all the way. He has this way with people. He can talk to them. He can cajole them. He can command them as necessary. And that was what he brought that made this mission possible. Is Somebody commented that his light, he had a light, he had a charisma, and he was at the same time such a human that they thought that he helped the killers connect to something that they lost. You know, in the course of what they were doing, they were reporting to their posts at these roadblocks in the morning and hanging out there all day, and the only other people that they would talk to were other killers or the people that they were terrorizing. Captain and Bai was like the only person that was able to be gracious that they would see, the only person that was able to be a human, as much discipline as that required on his part to do. Even the killers were talking about how warm he was, how much they enjoyed seeing him. One of his comrades from the human said he loved to share. He would go up to these roadblocks and happily hand them a beer or a cigarette. The killers would come to him and say, boss, I'm hungry, boss, I'm thirsty, and he would distribute his largesse to them. Also, interestingly, they called him boss, so I think that is that just goes more to how he was able to use the personal power that he had. And something really broke in these killers. I was reading some interviews with some rural killers, and even after the fact, they had a lot of difficulty processing the situation or even understanding what they were doing or that they had done something wrong. They were really operating in some strange space. One of them, when asked about the presence of God, said, well, God just kind of wasn't there. Uh, these guys are operating in a really inhuman environment, doing inhuman things. And Captain and Bai was able to work against that. It also helped him when he was dealing with people that weren't killers. A uh, perfect example is when General Dallaire saw him leading the civilians at the UN compound very early on before he saved the Prime Minister's kids. He was able to instill confidence in people. The other UN workers, who were so devastated when he died, they drew some strength from the power of his persona. And I guess the last thing that I could say about what he did was he was able to keep his decency, which is a sort of, you know, it sort of goes to spiritual courage because he kept his faith, and I think that would be whatever your opinion of faith or your personal religious beliefs, I think it would be very easy to lose your faith if you're working in Rwanda during the genocide. Uh, but he kept his. He remained devout to the last. And he also kept it in the right perspective. There's an old Hebrew law that I can't pronounce, but it means that the preservation of life overrides just about any religious rule. So, in Captain Mbai's case, you know, he's Muslim, but he chain smoker and he's given alcohol to people and the purpose is to save human lives. He didn't consider the letter of the law to be a particularly important blocker uh, in the course of his mission. So I think that's just about all that I have to say about Captain and the end. I still don't feel like I can properly convey how much I admire the guy or what a impressive dude he was. 
I uh, just hope that you've been interested by his story and uh, maybe that he inspires you in some way too. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to do any more of these. A friend of mine are gonna st- and I are going to start doing a podcast pretty soon. And uh, some of the feedback that I got from Aunt Diane was very interesting, and I'm going to use that in the, our future work. And feedback that I get from this I'll use too, so I appreciate any comments that any of you have. Uh, but that's about it for me. I hope you're doing okay. Good luck to everybody out there. It's been a rough 18 months or so, at least, for all of us. And I really hope that your personal worlds come back to equilibrium soon. Uh, good luck to y'all, and goodbye.